Benjamin Sooner Grass and the Cauldron of Penguins is about rehabilitating the image of redheads in the world. It is an actual movie. A nerdy, skiffle-loving redhead. Who um, discovers that he's a part of a magical circle or something. And um, he moves to Australia to study um, at Fairpoint Academy. It's about the transcendent power of rock and roll music. I think it's about a uh, young man trying to find himself. It's about Ken Russell references, it's about James Bond references, it's about jokes, it's about Stephen Fry. Well, it's a classic story, isn't it? It's about a uh, young man trying to find his place in the world, of, you know, fighting all sorts of odds to... Uh, to find out what his life's all about. It's about a nerdy boy who discovers that the reason he doesn't fit in is because he's really a magical boy with a magical father and a magical heritage he didn't know about. And once he discovers this, he's got to go off to magic school, learn a bunch of magic so that he can be taught to fight this great battle. Stay home tonight, home tonight. Bad mass coming home. Uh, and do you want to? Do we need to reprise the uh, Benjamin Snellgrass story? Do you think people have remembered that? But it'd be worth recapping. Well, Wittertainment, the BBC's flagship film program, Dr. Mark Kermode and Simon Mayo. Uh, cast your minds back, please, to last February. Mark's review of the Chris Columbus film, Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. There's a key difference between this and Harry Potter. Do you know what it is? The name? Well, the Percy Jackson is quite like Harry Potter. Percy Jackson, Harry Potter. I mean, they could have called him Benjamin Sniddlegrass just to make sure that it wasn't. Benjamin, Benjamin Sniddlegrass, the, the Cauldron of Penguins, is that the works film I want to see. Uh, right, the man who's faulted all is is Jeremy Dillon. He's in a studio in Sydney. Hello. What on earth have you done? <laughs> well, that's an excellent question. Um, well, I heard The Good Doctor's review of Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief back on February 12th last year, and as soon as that title came along, I was inspired. I mean, that's a great title. That's up there with Surf Nazis Must Die or Nymphoid Barbarian from Dinosaur Hell was one of the great titles. And it inspired me. I did a poster. I did some sort of comedy press releases, put this stuff up on the internet. And then some people sent it into your show. And I was faced with a rather surreal experience of you reading it out on air. And um, this deluge of fan mail, mainly from Finland and the Netherlands, started to come into me, encouraging me to make the film. I asked you for advice, and you two told me to go ahead and do it. So in a really, very real sense, it's actually all your fault. Fair enough. I kind of had to come up with a storyline that fit, that was at least semi-coherent, and sort of fit the structure of that first Harry Potter um, novel and film. Because the whole gag is that... Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief is incredibly derivative of Harry Potter. So having not seen Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief, our parody of Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief also had to be incredibly derivative of Harry Potter. This is the story of a boy named Benjamin Sniddlegrass. I wrote Benjamin Sniddlegrass for Andrew Christie. If he'd turned me down, this film wouldn't exist. I wouldn't have made it without him. Um, Jeremy sent me an email and he said that he had me in mind for the role of Benjamin Snittlegrass, which was the lead character, and he said, um, you know, it would be filmed over a certain period of time and if I was willing to help him make some magic, so I said yes. Andrew was a good choice for playing Benjamin Snittlegrass because, well, he had red hair, which that helped. Um, and, you know, has an understanding of everything that comes along with having red hair. I've been watching Andrew, he's a friend of mine, I've been seeing him in uh, amateur musical productions for a good four and a bit years now, and he really impressed me with a kind of, a, a, a real presence that actors his, his age generally don't have because he's got so much stage experience and also because he, he's able to encapsulate both that, that real nerdy character that people associate with redheads unfairly, I think, um, which I've seen, him, I've seen him play that type a number of times on stage, but in real life he's got a real great personal charisma and he's the polar opposite of the nerd character and I felt if I could write him a character whose arc went from 
one end of that spectrum almost all the way to the other end of that spectrum that it'd be something that he could really sink his teeth into and I'd be able to build a whole film around him. He's a very professional kid and you know when you're on set with him or on stage with him you you can feed off his energy. He's a, he's a good kid to work with. I think he's, a, he's an amazing little actor. He, he, he's really good at what he does. He's a, I think, he's, I think you know, he's one of those real good little character actors. He was really, really flexible with changing the characterization for however Jeremy wanted it to kind of trail. He's got a really tough job. He's almost never off screen. I think there's two scenes he doesn't appear in. So he really had to be able to carry the film and he, he justified every bit of faith I had placed in him. The only unfortunate thing about this film is you won't get to see him sing and dance because, you know, he's, he's, he's as far as an actor is concerned, he's the full package. As far as a human being is concerned, he's just, you know, a lovely, lovely boy. Well, I call him a boy because he's, you know, 40, 40 odd years younger than me. He's just a lovely, lovely kid to work with and a, and a great talent to come. By the way, I'm Scarlett Sarah Christie McKenna. Be seeing you. Well, I'd worked with Kat before on a short film called Have a Cigar that we shot um, in, in 2009. I've done like a couple of short films, um, mainly have a stage, musical theatre um, background. But she really impressed me when we did that film. So when it came to do Benjamin Sittlegrass and I was looking for a, a Hermione kind of character, I had, I had Kat a bit in my head. Benjamin Snittlegrass, you are following me. Scarlett sort of fulfills the plot requirements of Hermione, but her character is more in line of what uh, you'd call a manic pixie dream girl, which is a term Nathan Rabin came up with. And that's like Catherine Hepburn and bringing up Baby is that kind of character. And the more modern incarnations of that is like Zoe Deschanel, she often plays those kind of figures. She has guts, like, do you know what I mean? Like, she's, I liked that she was sort of, she took. Benjamin under her wing, but you know, it was just you know a little bit odd. She's a couple of years older too, a bit more mature, a little bit eccentric. She ends up saving him at the beginning, and then he ends up saving her at the end. Working with Kat was a joy. <laughs> she has this very bubbly personality, which um, you know you can obviously tell from her performance. And it's great because she's always laughing and there were moments where she, could, she couldn't stop laughing and in fact it was just perfect for her character. Kat's got kind of a Diana Rigg quality to her I think. Um, a, a, a slightly bubbly but a, elegant and you always feel like she's a couple of steps ahead of you um, which, is a, which is a quality that really suited the character. Hello. My name is Werner Herzog. I will be your headmaster for the new year. Werner Herzog is one of modern cinema's great self mythologizers I've heard of Werner Herzog. I've actually seen uh, some of his uh, some of his docos. I'm not a great fan, I must admit, but uh, he's a very interesting person, and uh, I could see that. You know, given a given a few uh, twists and turns, his life could have actually turned out this way. This eccentric Bavarian madman who drags ships over mountains and is constantly having people shooting at him or diving through his kitchen window or trying to shoot him during meetings. I'm here at the Fairport Academy on an exchange program from the Werner Herzog Rogue Film School of Germany. I wanted to have a Dumbledore character who was who represented the insanity of this world. I can't really write one-liners, so most of the humour in Besat Cop comes from people taking really odd and extraordinary situations as normalcy and Herzog's the real example of that because that's how he handles himself in interviews. A lot of the dialogue, a lot of Herzog's dialogue in the film is, is paraphrased from interviews or it's some, like some of it's even verbatim. Um, there's the stuff about the thrill of being unsuccessfully shot at. That kind of, that's, that's real Herzog. Jeremy, I believe, saw me in a play. I was in um, The Little Shop of Horrors and he playing Mushnik, their shop owner. And he uh, liked what he saw and he asked me to be involved. 
Dorian's performance is not so much an impersonation of the real Werner Herzog, but it's halfway between that and the character as he would be played by Bela Lugosi. So he's got that, that kind of... Um, he could be in Young Frankenstein. I mean, it's very hard to keep a, a straight face when you're working with Dorian because he's so funny and so he's such a brilliant comedic actor. And I, I love what he brought to that. He's got great physicality. That's the one thing you get out of more, more experienced players, people who are um, a bit older. They have a lot more, um, a much keener sense of what to do with their bodies. So there's, there's little physical bits that Dorian does in a lot of his scenes that, that get laughs that weren't in the script, and that's just, that was great. Welcome to Fairport Island, home to your new seat of learning, Fairport Academy. Pentangle is kind of a cross between Hagrid, Morpheus from The Matrix, and Johnny Cash. I don't like this, Ben, but I won't stop you like a strong masculine presence because the film doesn't really have any of those like someone with a real deep voice who is going to have a real authority and presence to him and my mind immediately went to Alex so I started crafting the role for him. Well my role as Pentangle was to give Benjamin a bit of guidance and to be his mentor and that strong kind of male presence in his life that obviously didn't have with his father not being around. Alex's background is mainly in radio so he really knows how to use his voice and I like the idea of him handling, like he handles most of the exposition in the film. I, I actually got the acting bug back in uh, 2007 and uh, it was something that you know I, I thought for myself because I, I, my career is in radio, I started radio when I was pretty young. Alec and Andrew built up a real warm relationship on set, which was great and mirrored the relationship the characters were meant to have. Our relationship was one quite similar to what's on the film. He'd, you know, run, run me through this and talk me through that. Uh, yeah, he, he kind of approached me for the part of Pentangle. I don't know why. I think, I think he thought I was kind of the Pentangle. I had the Pentangle look or the character of Pentangle for some reason. You know, I'm always, you know, around my own kids kind of trying to guide them and teach them, so I think Jeremy might have saw a little bit of pentangle in me anyway. When this scene starts, this is the stage, that's the, the floor of the room. You're, you've, you've caught and come over, but you're going, okay, then we'll have the things here, we'll put the microphone here, and maybe just the thing here, so you're planning this all out. So, so, we start there and work our way up to pro proper concerts with with people who are still alive today, us, tomorrow, Bruce Springsteen. Hi, I'm Sarah Linegar. I play Lucy Snittlegrass in Benjamin Snittlegrass and the Cauldron of Penguins. Well, Sarah was actually the first person I officially cast in Bissat Cop, even though I'd um, written the part of Ben for Andrew and I'd sent the script over to him and he was reading it. I was over at Sarah's place one day and she was in the other room watching TV and I walked over to her and I said So Sarah, how do you feel about being tied up on a pool table and being sacrificed to a god? And she said, yep, yeah, sure, I'm in. Which was a fairly painless casting process. So I got involved in the project uh, when I got contacted by uh, an old colleague of mine, Oscar Partridge, uh, who said there was a movie happening and he told me the story, he got, got me the contacts, he explained a little bit about the project and um, so I immediately contacted Jeremy and immediately um, Yavor was really enthusiastic about the project, asking all the right questions and his, the level of preparation that he was going into for that first shoot really um, reassured me and made me feel really confident that it was going to be a good working relationship. He had thought everything out, he knew what he wanted. Okay, here we are, we're in the car, we're on the way to the first day of shooting for Benjamin Stettelgrass and the Cauldron of Penguins. We're shooting in Oxford Street, which is Sydney's uh, noted gay bookshop district. Uh, there soon. We are currently in the Exchange Hotel, otherwise known as Pew Bar, and we are currently about to film the dreamscape of Benjamin Snittlegrass. It was kind of an eye opener for myself. So, you know, I'm, I'm this little fellow from out in the outback where <laughs> you don't get to kind of see, I suppose, the colour of a place like Oxford Street in Sydney, but um, the first day of shooting... It's on a Sunday in the Exchange Hotel on Oxford Street. And I'd been to a gig there a, a, a month or two earlier when I was sort of in the middle of trying to figure out where we were going to shoot all the film. 
and I noticed that each room there was decorated completely differently and had a completely different design feel to it and they almost looked like they were from different buildings. Andrew also had the challenge of playing two characters. He was Benjamin and he was also Percy, his father, for the early um, the prologue and for the flashback. When we shot that Percy scene at the start of the day, he had the moustache and he got to put the cool suit on and got to be uh, James Bond for a bit. Darling. Die. On the first day of filming, I was introduced to who would be playing my wife in the film. Uh, this was actually the first time I met Sarah and we, you know, had a kiss to do and, and we had to sort of have this chemistry on screen, which we hadn't actually had before since this was the first time I met her. But he was su such a gentleman, so calm, easy to work with, great to work with. He was so professional. It was pretty hectic because um, the venue was really hard to acquire, so we had a lot to shoot on that day. Um, and pretty much everything had to be like, jump in, jump out, jump in, jump out. The first day, um, I like, ridiculously overscheduled everything. I was, I was hoping we were going to shoot about it after the film in one day. And we ran over schedule and we ended up having to dump a bit of stuff we were filming. And that was a, a real lesson on how to budget your time in, um, in shoots. I, 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 was, I was exasperating you for I could tell. I go, why isn't the lighting done? We need it. We've only got 20 minutes left in this setup and we need to move on. And um, we ended up getting great stuff on that day. But it was a, it was a real learning curve going into my first um, really big extensive shoot on that day. And, and we're in London. See the big palace-like thing behind me where one of the Henrys apparently lived. Um, yes, here we are, London, England. Stephen Fry, um, I, I, I still cannot quite fathom the idea that Stephen Fry is in my film. At first, she made him sleep in the ironing cupboard. When he outgrew that, she moved him into the bathroom. When I wrote the narrated section of the film, I wrote it with his voice in my head because he has that real calm, incredibly reassuring. He's got a credibility to his performances as a narrator, as a as an audio book reader. You believe anything he tells you. It's narrated by Stephen Fry, titled by Mark Kermit, and it genuinely is Stephen Fry saying Benjamin Snell. It is, isn't it? I've seen, I've seen the trailer, and I wonder whether it was somebody doing it, but it genuinely is Stephen Fry, isn't it? Because Stephen Fry went to Australia, and clearly your man there was waiting on the tarmac the minute he got off the plane. <laughs> it's August, he's doing a one-man show at the Sydney Opera House, and I'm in the front row, and as he's about to walk off stage, I got up, walked over to him, handed him an envelope and inside the envelope was a copy of the script and a cover letter saying hi I'm that nutso kid from Australia making a film out of the gag from the Kermode show uh, will you please narrate my movie Your Majesty or words to that effect not expecting to hear anything more of it but two days later I booted up the computer and there was an email from him in my inbox saying I've got half an hour free this afternoon come down, come down to my hotel and we'll do the recording Whenever you're ready. Okay. This is the story of a boy named Benjamin Sniddlegrass. Of course, he was perfect on the first take. Everything I could have possibly wanted, exactly how I'd imagined it when I wrote it, down to every individual cadence, every individual inflection. And he couldn't have been lovelier to me. I mean, they tell you not to meet your heroes because they might let you down, but Stephen Fry was every bit Stephen Fry that I would ever want him to be. Benjamin Sniddlegrass and the Cauldron of Penguins by Jeremy Dyson. Dylan. The Dylan! Sorry, Jeremy Dyson's in the League of Gentlemen, isn't it? Do you know that? Yes, TV yes. Series, uh, Mark Gatiss and... Yeah, that's right. And Steve Pemberton, there's a Jeremy Dyson in there. I think there is. Sorry, Jeremy Dylan. It's I'm a flattering mix-up. <laughs> Rollin. And action. You're not normal, Benjamin Sniddlegrass. I think Linda might be the most contrasting between um, the character and what they're like in real life. 
I just went to St. Vincent de Paul's to find some clothes uh, that were not too flattering and um, it would suit the character, the nastiness of the character a little bit. There were quite, for the short part I had, there were quite a few costume changes. So um, I had to find some bits and pieces, quite cheap. <laughs> and, uh, so that's what I did. She's like a second mother to me, so her playing my aunt was was quite humorous because she had to swear at me. She was great. She came in, um, we shot all that stuff at my place and we got through those scenes really quickly um, because she, she was so um, engaged with it. For the uh, Fairport Academy dorm scenes, we shot in a hotel. Now the hotel shoot was quite interesting because uh, I, I actually rang Jeremy because I, I do a little bit of boxing on the side. It's, it's kind of something I love doing. Um, I was actually the weekend before the shoot at the hotel. I was I was in the New South Wales State Championships and I had to fight. Now, when you're amateur boxing, you have to actually shave your moustache and beard. It's part part of part of the rules in amateur boxing. You have to shave. So I rang. I actually rang Jeremy and I said, uh, "Oh, mate, look, I got a bit of an issue." Um, and I said, "Well, I was thinking maybe you know, Pentangle could do a magical trick or something." And all of a sudden, you know. The beard's gone and the mo's gone and stuff. And he's like, okay, we'll try that. Action. I'm never again writing a scene set in an elevator until I can afford to build a fucking elevator set. That was an absolute nightmare. I never want to film an elevator scene ever again. We we couldn't keep the elevator open because we were shooting. Like it was a Sunday, but they still had guests at the hotel who needed to use the elevator. So if we'd, we'd shoot two takes and then we'd all have to um, we'd have to let the doors close, let the elevator go back down and then bring it back up again and then shoot another couple of takes. Do what everyone else does when they start a new school. Oh. Make a friend. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not talking to her. You called. <laughs> What's it going to do? Oh, sorry. We'll take it out. Of the other <laughs> I guess with situations like that where you have things coming up that are out of your hand, you know, out of your control, all you have to do is keep your calm, keep your nerve, and just keep going, and that's what we did. Hello. I'm Jeremy Dillon, director of Benjamin Snittlegrass and the Cauldron of Penguins, and we're here at Epping Boys High School for day three of filming. You know what? I'm sick of seeing films like this where the people, they go to magic school or whatever, and they don't look anything like real schools. They look like the ritziest possible private school. They look like, they look like King's College Cambridge or something. So then I thought, well, no, let's do magic school as a real school, and obviously, my school was the first one I thought of, so I got in touch with the staff, Mr. Garrard, the principal, the headmaster at Epping Boys, and he was extremely generous and extremely helpful um, with setting up my filming there and, and letting me shoot in the library and in the hall and in the executive office and in the classroom and out in the grounds. And we were able to use that as our Fairport Academy, and I really like that when Ben goes to school, he goes to an actual school. It looks like a school. Uh, there was one scene where Werner Herzog mixes up this potion which I'm which I have to drink and on on set there were quite a few things which I wasn't really happy about that were in the drink like sure there was Gatorade there was you know energy drinks and there was iced coffee and flour and unfortunately I had to drink this and it was the foulest tasting thing I've ever had to drink Unfortunately, we had to do quite a few takes, so I had to taste it more than once. Hey, well, it's uh, finally the final day of shooting. We're here down around Luna Park um, in Sydney. I've had most of the week, I've had this massive throat infection. It's like having a ping pong ball lodged down your windpipe. Um, but I'm right as rain, all of a sudden, just in time. We're here among some of Sydney's best known tourist icons, like uh, Opera House over there, Sydney Harbour Bridge and a tall man in a leather overcoat. Yeah, so final day of shooting. It's been a bit of a long road. It's October 17th today, and our first day of shooting was um, the 6th of June. 
but it's actually only been seven days of, um, of shooting over that, so that's pretty good, I think, shoot a feature film in seven days. Um, I think they shot phone booth in seven days, but that's all in a phone booth, and this isn't, so I think we're more impressive. The last day of shooting. Um, we thought outside, since there's no lighting setups, it'll be much easier. We thought wrong. For all you, you know, cinema goers, be careful. Outside is a whole new ball game. The real challenging thing with our last day of shooting was we were shooting on a train without a permit, so we had to get on. We had three stops before we got to uh, Central and we wanted to get off. So we had to scramble on, quickly, wildly unpack all the gear, set up, go, action! One take, two takes, another half a take. Oh, well, okay, we're coming up to a stop. Okay, cut, pack the gear up, hope we got it. We're better clothes and more banjo playing. So I'm supposed to believe that the reason why I don't get on with people is because I'm actually a magical boy. Magical that's guerrilla filmmaking, that's the Werner Herzog approach. I was quite proud we pulled that off. I see you there. The music was always going to be an integral part of Beset Cop. Obviously on our budget we weren't going to be able to license any rock and roll music from the 50s, any of that Elvis stuff. So that forced me to come up with an original rock star. And I thought instantly, he's got to be a redhead. And that's how Ben's going to have this hero worship thing for him. So this shared shade of red gave Ben hope as he trudged through his dreary existence. And so I came up with the idea of Johnny Leroy because I knew John Sewell, this redheaded um, singer and guitar player from a ska punk band called Jump the Shark. Hello, my name is John Sewell, and I'm Johnny Leroy, and these are my impulsives. Hey, I'm Riley Moore, I'm playing Rod Roger Moore. Hey, I'm Peter Pistorius, I'm playing bass. Headed into the recording studio and cut a few uh, skiffle songs, sort of a slightly Dodge Brothers-ish, early Elvis, Buddy Holly, that kind of thing for the soundtrack. I wanted to reference these great mythic images of teenagers in the late 50s, early 60s, like you know, like Keith Richards talks about, um, listening to Radio Luxembourg with one ear up against the stereo, listening to Chuck Berry records and Buddy Holly records coming in from the States that they wouldn't play on the BBC. Well, Jeremy called me up and um, asked me if I had any sort of skiffle slash rockabilly songs that we could use for the movie, and um, uh, I had one that was sort of half finished that I'd been writing with Jason Bone, and um, we uh, got the call from Jeremy, and I sat down, and we finished the thing in that night, and I sent it to him at about 2.30 in the morning, and there it was, Judgment Day. Been double crossed, and nothing left to confess. If I meet you when I'm on my judgment day, oh, well, I keep waiting, waiting, waiting for my ship to come along. Hey, come on. And I keep praying, praying, praying that I strike my soul go. I see the lights who come and seek me home. So we had one song. And then I remembered I'd been working on a project the year before which had kind of fizzled out but would cut a couple of songs for it. And one of them was a version of this song Famous that Mike Carr and Nicky Bennett wrote. The song Famous was originally a song that I'd written with uh, Nicky Bennett. Um, fabulous performer, I can say that because I'm married to her. But we wrote that probably five, six years ago and it originally was like a real grungy kind of rock song. So this is kind of what it sounded like when we first heard it. <laughs> I see you there. I feel you looking through me. We were trying to run through it and we just weren't feeling it with that that arrangement, the way it sounded. And like the idea was Flo to do it kind of more of a rock thing, like an early Kinks kind of song. I remember Riley throwing out this riff and he just kind of played it, it was da 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 
and literally from there that's where we built the whole song on that foundation. Lyrically we changed it to famous and um because it sort of like suited the whole thing better. It talks about fame and talks about that idea of hero worship in it. It really lends itself to the thematic importance of Johnny Leroy. Anyway, that song lay there dormant for probably 12 months until it came back as a skillful song by Johnny Leroy. So, I mean, that song's had many lives and um, in, I'm proud to say that it's through the movie quite a fair bit and it's always been a favourite song and I was always wondering where that song was going to be used one day and I'm Glad to say that it's been used a lot. Hey, we're back here with Jeff Cripps at um, A Sharp Studios again for the second round of Snittlegrass recording sessions. Today we're cutting Bad Man, the title theme of the film. It's going to play over the main title. Well, Bad Man was a bit of a holdover from uh, the previous, from a short film I'd made called Have a Cigar, which for various reasons didn't quite get finished. But we'd cut a blues rock version of this great song, Bad Man, that Rob Draper, a singer-songwriter from Melbourne who I'm friends with, so I ended up using that over the end titles of the Sat Cop. But I wanted to do another version for the main titles, and Rob and I had talked about the idea of a female vocalist doing it because it, it gave the lyrics a whole other connotation. He's a bone fire burning, should be underground. He's sick and tired of the learning. I've always wanted to work with Nassim. I think she's got a great soul kind of voice. Um, so I, I got her, I put this great band together, great players that I've been wanting to work with for a while, and Riley and Tim, who are also on the Johnny Leroy and the Impulsive Sessions. Hi there, we're in the Brain Studios in Surrey Hills doing overdubs for the soundtrack song, Bad Man. Decided to remix the track do a bit more guitar work on it. Well, at the moment I'm playing a Fender Esquire guitar and it's very nice. I've got a different pickup in there. And I use a tone bender, solar sound copy tone bender, which gives the fuzz sound. It's a big part of my sound. And I use a echo pedal, which is a Dan Electro thing. We had the track and it sounded good, but I just felt like it could be a bit more debauched. I really wanted the track to sound like it was cooked up by a bunch of heroin addicts in a basement in Harlem. Now I don't know if we quite got to that but yeah, I, I think it sounds pretty cool the way it turned out. I've known Mike Carr for donkey's years and I've always wanted to do something with him. And he offered to do the score for this. I wouldn't have had the nerve to ask him. Jeremy I've known since he was a kid and um... I've always considered that great things were going to happen with Jeremy and um, so it was part of my motivation to be involved. However, when he asked me to do the music, it was over a few drinks at a party and I remember saying, yeah, yeah, I'll do the music for you, just send me through the film, you know, send me through the stuff and I'll put some music to it, thinking that it was a 12 minute trot fest kind of film, short film. And uh, lo and behold, it was a 70-something minute feature film. So when I, got the, uh, when I got the footage, I was a little shocked, a little under pressure. He didn't, he didn't have time um, to work on it for a couple of months after we first spoke about it. But after I, I sent him the, the rough cut of the film, he sent me back the first few ideas he had and he called up and we'd talk about it. And then we, he didn't really do anything more on it for a, another month because he had, was working on some other projects. And then over Christmas, 
he, he, he started calling me up during the day and we'd talk about so the um, the scene with Aunt, Aunt David what are you feeling for that and I'd say oh yeah I want this like kind of finger picked acoustic stuff for that and he said okay well like melancholy yeah sort of and then okay what about the flashback scene that's yeah, more bombastic more of like a, a, a Danny Elfman kind of thing more Wagnerian and um, and then I'd wake up the next morning and there's been emails from him at two, like two or three in the morning he'd gone into his studio and whipped up all these these um, great score elements and sent them through. Well having received these discs from Jeremy I um, proceeded to do this the first time I'd done anything like this in my life so I wasn't sure how the process worked I'd seen on TV you know you got uh, score writers for, for movies you got big screens set up everywhere and and um, multiple instruments and stuff like that. Well, I had a little Casio MIDI keyboard and um, my little Mac, MacBook and uh, garage band. So this is how I started, thinking that it was going to be easy, you know. But once you get to like the 60, 65th minute of the movie, you're thinking, my oh God, I'm running out of ideas. What am I going to do next? But um, the process was really interesting for me, a real learning experience, and um, I'm, I'm glad I did it because... Uh, Hopefully next time he does it, his multi-million dollar feature film for, uh, for Fox Studios, I'll be invited along to do the music. The animation was something that we really decided to put more of in after the fact. Originally it was just going to be the main title sequence and then um, Yvonne and I were talking, we came up with the idea of having these animated chapter headings as well. And I became involved um with the, the project um, very late in the piece. I think the film was already shot by then for, uh, after quite a while. And um, yeah, I think it was around December. Um, the cinematographer, um, Yvonne Dimitrov, he, he um, sent my film I did uh, last year, uh, an animated film I did, uh, to the director, Jeremy Dillon. We got together for a lunch meeting and talked about ideas and we were instantly on the same page. When I talked about the title sequence, it turned out Sean was a Bond nut as much as I was, and we had all these reference points with the Morris Binder title sequences for the Goldfinger and stuff. And I told him, like, instead of naked chicks, naked penguins, get a bit of the guitars, that kind of stuff in there. And I just, he came back to me about a week or two later with a mock-up of some ideas he had for the title sequence and it was perfect. I, I really want to also have a, a sense of continuation. I want to make a smooth transition without really any cuts. So that's why I'd have like the penguin move across into a hill and like then the hill turning into a guitar, into a guitar and then the guitar turning into a penguin gun or something like that. I, I, I just really like the to um, just have that flow and that, that's just the way that the Bond titles I felt work. They always have this kind of smooth movement to them. It's no use, Mrs. Sniddlegrass. You can struggle all you like. Those knots will not yield. Hi, I'm Lol McKenna and I voice the character of Lord Emmerich. Lord Emmerich is a, an evil madman with the face of a gorilla and oddly the voice of a female seductress. He has aspirations of world domination and he is actually sacrificing humans to the god Jerry Bruckheimer who makes some very bad action films. Well, Jeremy is a friend of mine and I've always wanted to be involved in one of his movies um, and I've always been really interested in voicing um, characters um, and animations and things like that so we thought that this would be the perfect opportunity to collaborate and so he just got me into his um, editing studio and um, I just played around and voiced the character of Lord Emmerich and uh, actually I invented a little bit of a penguin voice as well for him so um, yeah it's been really fun and um, hopefully the film is fantastic which I'm sure it will be Hello, Benjamin. Don't you think it's time you got some sleep? And cut. <laughs> Jeremy, how are you feeling? Well, my hands are shaking, my knees are weak, and I can't seem to stand on my own two feet.
Pentangle makes his entrance. <laughs> this is mini Pentangle, if we just take the hat and put the hat over. <laughs> I'm in this film. <laughs> Um, to be honest, I'm very nervous. I uh, don't know how it's going to turn out, so it's all this big buzz, and I am tingling, and I just don't know what's going to happen, so I'm very, very excited. Thank you all for coming. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Jeremy Dillon. I am the writer director, among other things, of Benjamin Snittlegrass and The Cauldron of Penguins, um, which I'm reliably informed is to date the only film made based on a throwaway gag from a film review. <laughs> um, and when I was 16, I set myself two goals, and I said, by the time I'm 18, I'll have something I've made on television, which I did. I had an ad campaign that I edited was on TV when I was 17. And I said, by the time I'm 21, I'll have made my first feature film. And I turned 21 in March, so just by the seat of my pants, we got there. Um, in the last, I don't know, 40 or 50 years, some people have remarked upon a certain decline in the standards of cinema, but I think even more worryingly is the decline in the standards of cinema etiquette from moviegoers. And I uh, would like to We'd like to correct that tonight, so I'm going to ask uh, Catherine Davies, Scarlett McKenna in the film, to um, get up and help me establish a code of conduct for cinema goers. <laughs> no irresponsible parenting. Your five-year-old does not want to see the latest Saw movie. You are using the cinema as a babysitter. Your child's moaning, whinging and crying is your fault and a profound annoyance to everyone else in the cinema. Your interrupted sleep caused by your child's nightmares are also your fault and serves you right. <laughs> no hobbies. This includes knitting, drug dealing, model aeroplane assembly, fighting, having sex, and updating Facebook. <laughs> and uh, now we're going to put these microphones away and get on with the show. I really appreciate all you guys coming out. I hope you enjoyed the film. Um, I'm going to my cast and crew now by getting them all to come down and stand next to me in the front. So, um. Woo! That was Benjamin Snittlegrass and the Cauldron of Penguins. Uh, what are your afterthoughts? <laughs> afterthoughts. Fire away. Oh, oh man. Um, well, I, I only found out there's an after party just then, and I, I wasn't invited. I did, I did all the, the animations two months, and I was not invited, invited so I, I have a bad taste in my mouth. You? Bad taste in my mouth. Well, <laughs> my, my only uh, after comment is. Snittle I don't know, we just had a conversation about how everybody wants a slice of ginger flesh, yeah. so I'm a little put off. A barbecue, moment, a barbecue of ginger flesh. Yeah. My final comment, him and the barbecue. be still and you'll get your slice of ginger flesh. You know, it's funny, sitting there watching the credits roll at the end of the film at the Dandy, I felt like it should feel more final, like it's a year of work. A year of extremely hard and punishing work, and now we're here, and the film's done. But it felt more like the start of something than the end of something. Yeah, well, I've been waiting, waiting, waiting for my ship to come along. Hey, mom. come on. And I keep praying, praying, praying that storm might turn to go. Oh, then I took a fall, ain't even got my shirt Lord, it hit me hard when I hear the dirt But I ain't gonna cry, cause Lord, I tried I'll tell you what I say I 
I stand tall when I'm on my judgment day. Yeah, well, I stand tall when I'm on my judgment day. Yeah, well, I have a ball when I'm on my judgment day.